Marhaban wa ahlabakum fi baranamaj dakhil Washington. Ana mutifakum Robert Satloff. Havehi akbar maraka tashriya li idarat Biden. Yurid Biden an yarsud milyarat dolarat li irsal el aslaha ila Ukraina. Wa illa fa in Russia kan tantasar fi el harb. Wal jumhuriyun ablahu el betul abyad anhum len yusawatu li dam Ukraina illa idha tawassala el reis illa hal lil azma ala hududna el janubiya. Heithu yatasallil el alaf illa America kul yom beinama le yafal haras el hudud shayan le ikafehim. Wa ala mada ashrin aman fashalat kul el juhud lil tawassul illa itafak tajri'i mutaalek bil hijra. Donald Trump min jahatihi yu arid eya itafakia le anha kadtanhi el azma al al hudud. Well, the Velik, Fakad Talaba, a damn modules in the web of Jamurin, built a sweet dud mashrur, Kirar, Kenu Kad, Ektarahuhu, Sabakan. Fahel sa yuai dun, Maukif Trump. O Maukif Zumalayahim, El Jamurin, fi modules a shuyuk. Well, hell, Satastalem, Ukrania, El Aslaha, Eleti Tajaha, Le Muharaba, Russia. Wahel sa tanja fi nehayat al amr fi tarmim wad hududna el janubia. Le monakasha el maraka el siasia el mutaalika be hududna el janubia. Wa be ukrania. Well in the chabat el riasia. Yasurni an asta dev nukba min el sahafiin el marmukin. Daniel Lipman, Steve Clemens, wa mini racker. Welcome back to Dachel, Washington. There is a big legislative presidential showdown coming, and it it is about almost everything that is important for American foreign policy and American domestic security, from Ukraine, Taiwan, Israel, down to the southern border, and even our federal budget. To discuss what the issues are, and why this is an important bill, and what might likely happen with its impact on our presidential election, I'm delighted to welcome Steve Clemens, Daniel Lipman, and Minnie Racker. Thank you all for joining us this morning. So Daniel, first, just give us some background. What is this all about? So this Congress is very bad at actually doing their job on a regular basis. Uh, and so they often like to group uh, lots of bills together to make it easier to pass. Uh, and so uh, Ukraine is basically uh, out of uh, weapons uh, from our side uh, and aid. And so there was a big piece of this for Ukraine. Uh, Taiwan needs help shoring up their defenses against a potential Chinese invasion. Israel needs uh, military help uh, because of the Gaza war. And also there is a huge crisis at the southern border. And so this was this bill was going to uh, tighten uh, asylum rules, uh, make it easier for the president to declare, uh, to shut down the border, uh, increase work visas, uh, but it's facing a lot of uh, uphill sledding in Congress. So, Minnie, how does all these issues get wrapped up into one big bill that everyone will have their view on each individual component, and how is it possible to 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 get everybody to agree on anything. <laughs> well, so I would say the way that this happened was there's a lot of um, you know largely Republican voters, but some Americans of all stripes who were increasingly opposed to foreign aid. And there's kind of some messaging around you know we need to deal with our own issues and our own border first. So Republicans initially insisted if we were going to do all of this foreign aid, we need to also, you know, deal with the problem at the border. Um, of course, now the problem is they can't agree on these issues. And interestingly, it's actually the border issue and the Republicans who were holding it up. They said they wanted to get the border solved and Biden came to play ball with them. And then he, um, they, they worked out a compromise and now it's Republicans who actually are unwilling to fix the border issue and deliver that foreign aid as well. 
So, Steve, help me and help our viewers understand some of the politics here. Joe Biden is making a big give from his view on border security. Um, why aren't Republicans jumping for joy that the president has has surrendered on their key issue? Well, some Republicans were jumping for joy until Donald Trump began jumping up and down in protest because Donald Trump is running for the presidency and running to, to head the, the Republican ticket, but he wants to have this issue unresolved uh, when he is facing uh, likely Joe Biden, you know, for the presidential runoff. And so I think as Daniel and Minnie said, the tension over this is really a wing of isolationist Republicans has long opposed continuing to support the Ukraine conflict. Um, there's a lot of support on both sides for Israel, but the reason these issues get bundled is not because of efficiency. It's because one side is trying to force the other to come along with something. And so what the Republicans were trying to do was to attach border security and to attach a lot of things that many liberal Democrats were opposed to, to say, if you want Ukraine aid, you want Israel aid, you want Taiwan aid, well, then you have to um, swallow our medicine when it comes to uh, southern border dynamics and trying to uh, create a very tougher uh, treatment of immigrants and those seeking asylum coming into the United States. And so this is about that. They achieved an enormous amount that many left-wing Democrats are, are frustrated by, but they don't want to abandon Ukraine. And so in that situation, Donald Trump said, wreck it. Let's undermine this situation because I want a messy border when I'm running for office for the presidency. So Daniel, just let's take a focus for a moment just on the Senate, which seems to have been remarkably mature um, in uh, uh, certain senators rising above normal partisanship to reach an agreement that has eluded uh, um, uh, Congress for, for years on border security and, and other issues. Tell me a bit about the dynamics in the United States Senate. So the Senate is usually a the body that is more serious, that is uh, more moderate uh, than rabble rousers uh, in the House uh, on either side. Uh, and so right now with the Senate controlled by Democrats, uh, they wanted to work with Republicans, uh, make a bipartisan bill. And so the top Republican negotiator was a conservative Republican named James Lankford from Oklahoma. Uh, a very conservative state, um, and he spent months uh, working with a number of Democrats uh, and independents like Kristen Sinema from Arizona, uh, and the effort was to address this important crisis, which uh, a lot of cities uh, and states are facing that are not even on the border because they are getting historic uh, amount numbers of migrants. You've had several, you know, a number of million uh, in the last few years since Biden uh, took over. Uh, and not all of them have been sent back. Uh, and so the calculation was, hey, let's address this important issue. But as Steve said, uh, they want to keep this uh, as an issue for the campaign trail and want to hit Biden over and say, hey, you have an open border. You haven't done enough. And at many on the other side of Congress, the U.S. House of Representatives, new speaker of the House. Um, uh, what is the dynamic in that chamber? Well, the dynamic in the House is that you have a, uh, it took several weeks for a new speaker to even get elected. And so, uh, and they have a very tight margin. Uh, and so uh, the person they picked was a largely unknown congressman, socially conservative congressman from Louisiana, Mike Johnson. Uh, and uh, he has proved to be, uh, you know, trusted by a, a lot, both sides, uh, but uh, he is very weak and he has a, such a small margin of error because uh, Republicans did not win a huge majority in 2022 uh, when they took over the chamber because of the abortion issue. And so he has been losing some important votes, uh, such as on the Mayorkas hearing uh, impeachment and uh, an Israel aid package. Um, and so that is, uh, you know, you don't see that very often since he has the ability to put stuff on the on the House floor. And you know, you, you sometimes lose votes. And that is, uh, you know, in Britain, that would lead to a no confidence resolution. Um, uh, uh, we had a we had a guest recently on our show who who explained um, uh, the the real situation on the border, um, uh, which is difficult to 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 
you know, to comprehend um, um, uh, the extent to which thousands of people come across the border virtually every day and are not turned away. That once the moment you 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 can stick a toe on American soil, you can't be sent back. You have to be given an, an opportunity for an asylum hearing, and that could take years. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, and so millions of people have entered the border that way. Um, uh, is this, is, is, I mean, th this reality, put aside the politics, um, uh, many, do most Americans appreciate what is going on in the southern border? Is this, is this really politics or is this as, as real as, 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 as I've just described? I would say for the average American voter, it's a, a real problem. I was in Iowa last month, so the, the middle of the country, and the border was definitely the issue that came up the most. People are really worried about, um, you know, fentanyl crossing the border. They're really worried about just all of these um, migrants who, you know, we aren't tracking. Um, this bipartisan deal that it is about to fail um, is failing. Um, is, is pretty widely supported by Americans. They like these provisions that would kind of limit um, the number of people who can cross. They like these provisions that would uh, make it faster to process asylum claims. Um, so it's, it's a popular deal that due to governmental dysfunction is probably just not going to get done. And so Steve, what do you think the most likely outcome is here? Will our allies get the aid that they need? Or is all this going to sort of morph into the big decision in March about a potential government shutdown? You know, honestly, I think it's very unclear. I think it's a it's what we call in American form, it's, it's, it's a toss up. Um, and I have uh, often said, I don't believe that Ukraine funding and Israel funding and these other funding uh, necessities for American allies right now are in solid shape at all or likely at all. Whereas I heard many other people saying, oh, don't worry, there'll be a backroom deal. It's not clear at all because Donald Trump's ferociousness on this issue is significant. Um, he and a wing of Republicans are, are strongly opposed to Ukraine funding. And unfortunately in our former government, if you don't get those numbers, and that's one of the reasons why the Europeans are stepping up more quickly and more boldly um, than expected. They just did a $57 billion package of support from Ukraine because of the perception of America falling out of its what it had committed to and what it had told Ukraine would be likely coming. Remember, President Biden said there would be one last big package. And I think right now that is in real jeopardy and it may not happen. And this may, I don't want to be too dramatic here, but it may punctuate the real start of significant American disengagement from the kind of strategic commitments to partners um, that it has traditionally had over many decades. Uh, we have a NATO summit coming up. And I think if we fail to support Ukraine and some other um, allies in this moment, it's gonna be looked at as the moment where America began to really, really walk back from the rest of the world in the beginning of a kind of new isolationism, which is gonna be reflected on in the NATO summit this summer in Washington, DC. I mean, Daniel, help help our viewers understand the Republican Party usually strong on defense, um, tough on China, uh, um, uh, you know, wanting to protect our allies. How how should people around the world view this this apparent receding from uh, global commitments? I think Steve is exactly right. Uh, the things I would add to what he said is that Americans kind of got burned from the last 20 years uh, of war for the first uh, two decades of this century uh, in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan, where we lost thousands of soldiers. Uh, we spent trillions of dollars. Uh, we were not focusing on China when we probably should have uh, been. So we got uh, we were fighting the last war uh, and it to what an end. We uh, Iraq uh, is a country that is doing okay, but a lot of Americans say, what, what, what was it really worth it? And, and Afghanistan is controlled by the Taliban. Uh, and they've brought you know women back into the Stone Age, basically. And so uh, I think you have to couple that with the 2008 financial crisis uh, in terms of Americans viewing that 
uh, the establishment in Washington isn't really speaking to them, isn't really listening to them, uh, and is kind of catering towards corporate elites and the military industrial complex. And so no wonder uh, Americans now are saying, hey, do we really want to spend billions of dollars uh, on defending Ukraine's border when uh, to our own plain eyes, the American southern border with Mexico uh, seems to be wide open uh, for anyone to come? Um, all right. When we when we come back after the break, we're going to see what impact all of this is is having will have on the presidential election campaign because these issues will play directly into the contest between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, which looks like is going to be our contest once again in just a moment. Again, my guests today include Daniel Lipman. Daniel covers Washington politics for Politico, where he also authors the social data section of Politico's New York playbook. Previously, he was a reporter with the Wall Street Journal in New York. Also with us is Minnie Racker. Minnie reports for Time Magazine as a campaign's staff writer. Previously, she was a staff writer at National Journal, and she reported for the Los Angeles Times. Her work covers the intersection of politics, identity, and culture. And with us is Steve Clemens. Steve is the founding editor-at-large for Semaphore, an international news site. Previously, he was at The Hill, The Atlantic, New America Foundation, and the Nixon Center for Peace and Freedom. Um, uh, Steve, an appeals court just handed Donald Trump a significant defeat. What is that all about? And how do the judicial challenges uh, the Republican candidate faces play into the political challenges? Well, I think Donald Trump's um, lawyers thought that they had a case that they might be able to um, appeal all the way up to the Supreme Court asserting that the actions that he took while president of the United States made him immune from any challenges about political malfeasance or any other crimes at that moment. And there is a, uh, a school of thought that, that looks at the powers of the chief executive of the United States government of being so all-encompassing that that would be the case. So it's basically saying, as president, I'm above the law and I can't be held accountable by the courts. The, the appeals um, a court, in this case, three judges, decided, nope, you're a citizen, uh, Donald Trump. You're not a president in this matter. You're a citizen, Trump, because if you were to be given such immunity, you would be putting yourselves beyond the other branches of government. When you have a balance, you know, checks and balance system of, of, of government, it's basically saying um, you're not uh, immune in that case, and particularly not immune when it comes to the issue of um, you know, election solvency and trying to undermine that. So it's a very important case, and it could be appealed. Uh, we don't know at the time of our discussion right now whether he may appeal that to the Supreme Court. And if it did go to the Supreme Court, I think it would be very tough for the Supreme Court to undo this decision, which is very tightly written, uh, and it would be a remarkable thing. My, my gut tells me it's likely the Supreme Court may not even take it, which means that Donald Trump's trial will likely begin and proceed before um, the election takes place. And so there is a uh, uh, I think a you know a, a better than even chance that 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 happens, but that's the dynamic underway uh, between the various efforts right now to hold Donald Trump accountable for what he did on January sixth and trying to undermine the election results um, and an upcoming election, which is really a replay of the Biden Trump standoff, you know, of 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 the last election. And so so far, uh, many uh, uh, Donald Trump. His legal troubles have not impeded his march to the Republican nomination. Uh, Nikki Haley is the only candidate left standing uh, uh, in his way to achieve that uh, that nomination, and she um, she appears committed to stick it out. Is that right? Yes. So um, when I was reporting on Haley in December, um, she told voters that she was going to um, win in South Carolina and she was going to make a play straight through Super Tuesday. And right now that seems like what she's going to do. Um, she's invested a lot of resources in that. She's, you know, setting up her teams in the Super Tuesday states. Um, 
it it looks like a long shot. Everyone is widely expecting Trump to win. Um, that was widely expected even back in, you know, several months ago. Um, but with each contest, he's a, showing his dominance more and more. Um, so, you know, she looks like she's going to stick around for a little longer at least, but it, it will probably be a futile effort. Is, is the presumption, Daniel, that uh, if something happens to Donald Trump, uh, either physically or legally, the, and if she's the only person left in the race, she is the one person to inherit uh, just by virtue of being the only person left? Yeah, it reminds me of a, an NBC show that was uh, on for a long time called Last Comic Standing. Uh, and so it's kind of last candidate standing here uh, because she is hoping against hope that uh, something uh, that Trump will get convicted uh, before the convention uh, of some type of charge that will lead Republicans to uh, lose faith in him. Uh, so far, you know, he is. There's been so many different opportunities over the last seven years where uh, he could have been taken out as the nominee because of some controversy. He, you know, calling John McCain not a war hero, insulting Gold Star uh, military uh, surviving families. Uh, and so the list goes on. Uh, and so far, Trump's voters are just, uh, they're, they're ride or die, as they say, very just glued to him. Uh, and so she is, uh, this is a long shot, but as long as she has money to fund a campaign, then she will go forward. If she stops getting funded uh, by uh, small and big donors, then the campaign is over. So Steve, in this, uh, in, in the coming cycle, there's another big decision that some politicians will have to make, and that is whether to launch a third party or independent run for office. I know you're close to one potential candidate, um, a senator from West Virginia, um, uh, uh, potentially running under the no labels brand. Um, uh, what do you think? If we end up with Biden Trump, is there are we likely to see a significant um, independent run by you know, real candidates like like the senator from West Virginia, Joe Manchin? Well, I mean, I think it's a, I think there's a strong uh, chance of it. Um, it's certainly not known yet what Senator Manchin will decide, but I think there are other candidates out there as well who could join a ticket. Chris Christie, uh, uh, Larry Hogan, the former Republican governor of Maryland and others. Unlikely that they run, but they could be they could be part of the the process. And look, I think the issue is 70% of Americans are very dissatisfied with seeing a rerun of Biden and Trump, thinking American politics must be really broken if those are the two best candidates you can come up with. So the substantial dissatisfaction is out there. That doesn't answer the question of how an independent party run could achieve 270 electoral college votes, um, which is a, a, a staggering mountain. And I think it's something in my own conversations with Senator Manchin is weighing on him as he considers, you know, whether there's a pathway or not. And if there's no pathway or the pathway looks as if his, he said this, that is his entry into a race would yield a Trump win or something like that, he won't, he won't do that. But it's very, very hard to imagine a circumstance where a party out of nowhere comes and grabs 270 electoral college votes. Our constitution is sort of weird. If a third party were to come in and were to grab a substantial number of votes, but maybe not 270, but you created a condition where none of the candidates got 270 votes. We don't have a rerun. And the first in, in you know, the first, you know, get vote getter of electoral college votes doesn't win either. It goes to the House of Representatives to decide who is the president. The vice president is decided in the United States Senate. And under current conditions, Donald Trump would likely win. So many things on the agenda. Thank you, Steve Clemens, Minnie Racker, and Daniel Lippman for explaining all this to our viewers abroad. Thank you for joining me on Dackle Washington. Washington. In Arju el Tawasul Mai, Aber Twitter, ala hashtag Inside Washington, O Marasalti Mubasharatan, at Rob Satloff. Arakum Fulos Boil Mukbil, Wahata Delekehain, Shukran, Wa Ilelekah.